Chinese state-run media reports are focusing on the effectiveness of the ongoing rescue work amid severe flooding. But social media users are painting a different picture. Chinese citizens are questioning why authorities didn't give notice before opening the floodgates of a reservoir. That's after the released water flooded residential areas downstream. A third Chinese dam failed amid heavy rains. First, an over 60-foot-wide breach in the structure. Later, soldiers blasted a gap in it Wednesday, hoping to let floodwaters out. State-backed media are airing reports about severe flooding in Europe, but they are not giving much detail on flooding on home soil, instead praising the beauty of Beijing's post-rain sky. And in the U.S., the FBI tells American pipeline operators to secure their systems against foreign threats. Hackers working for the Chinese Communist Party are known to have accessed at least 13 systems between 2011 and 2013. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The capital city of China's Henan province drenched in 24 inches of rainfall since Monday. State-run media reports are focusing on how soldiers are helping residents and the effectiveness of the ongoing rescue work. But netizens posted videos on Chinese social media on Tuesday that paint another picture. One clip showed several people struggling in floodwaters. A woman on the bank is seen crying and seems to be calling for her mother in the water. What's more, a man can be heard saying people are in the water. Several people have drowned. That's as a man waded through the water, tossing a tire in for another person to grab onto. Several others seen washed away by the current. In a shopping mall, water started abruptly falling down from a toy store. On Tuesday, a train passenger captured video of torrential floods outside a train and posted it on Chinese messaging platform WeChat. She described the water as being up to her waist and noted her phone's low battery, saying she didn't know if it would become her last post. Another video shows water coming into the train and later inside a subway. A man who captured this clip said people had been carried out and showed no sign of life. Still another video features a resident sobbing, asking who will come to rescue them from the severe flooding. This woman captured a drowning victim. Found dead in the water, his body was moved to higher ground. The woman's voice is heard saying she was scared and her hands were shaking. She also explained there was another woman in the water but lost sight of them and that a man entered the water in search of the woman but couldn't find her. Likewise, on Tuesday, human remains were spotted and retrieved in Jinzhou City. The person who shot this clip said the body was found to be female and the apparent casualties, a few lucky ones, were saved. This successful rescue effort was also caught on camera. Citizens there are demanding answers from authorities, questioning why they weren't given a heads up before a move that made an already major disaster much worse. It comes after some passengers found themselves trapped on a dark subway on Tuesday, with floodwaters rising up to their chests. Earlier, a passenger sent a video to the Internet asking for help. He says he sensed something wasn't right. We're now trapped in the subway. The water is rising and it's climbing to our waists. Those seeing the video, please help us call the police. Videos circulating online show water pouring into the subway station. And it wasn't just the subway. Flooding also submerged much of the local area. In a video, a woman was struggling to escape a water current. As for the subway, the water later receded and passengers were able to escape, but some never made it past the next stop. Officials capped the death toll at 25 as of late Wednesday, 
But many are wondering if had authorities acted otherwise, some deaths could have been avoided. Record-breaking rain drenched the area the day of the accident. To relieve the added pressure on a nearby reservoir, authorities had released some of its water. That reservoir sits about 30 minutes away from the web of affected subway lines. But officials provided no warning before the reservoir adjustment. Beforehand, the subway was running uninterrupted as usual. Authorities finally shut down the subway at around 6 p.m., but by then it was already too late. The water had funneled into the subway tunnels, trapping riders inside. Heavy rainfall in central China's Henan province caused a 66-foot wide breach in a local dam. Chinese soldiers later blasted a gap in the middle of the dam on Wednesday to let the flood water out. The dam, named Yi He Tan, is the third to fail in China in recent days. Due to heavy rain, two dams in north China's Inner Mongolia collapsed on Sunday. The dam in Henan is located in a city of 7 million. Weather authorities in China also issued the highest level of warning for the region, following record rainfalls in recent days. Amid severe flooding in central China, people who've become trapped are desperately calling for rescue, both through phone calls and posting online. At the same time, state-run media announced that all victims have already been brought to safety. Many residents in central China's Zhengzhou city, Hunan province, called for help online during severe flooding on Tuesday, especially the hundreds trapped in the subway system. Chinese media reported that night saying all passengers have been rescued and are all safe. But until early morning, SOS messages from passengers trapped underground kept flooding in, and they didn't see any rescue teams. By Wednesday morning, many people in cars were still seen soaked in water, with no rescue efforts in sight. The most disastrous appears to be Line 5 of the city's subway. The water in the train cars is soaking passengers up to their chests and shoulders. The situation in other subway lines isn't much better. An online post says around 200 people are still trapped in subway line 1 and are calling for rescue. It says the water is very deep now and the emergency rescue line cannot be reached. The post adds that after hours of being stuck in there, people are no longer just cold and hungry. They are also suffocating. And residents also say that people in subway line 2 didn't get any rescue either, so some people tried to get out by themselves. A man that managed to escape on Wednesday morning told NTD that he saw hundreds of cars soaked in water on the streets, but there's no rescue at all. We swarm out at 8 this morning. Nobody was there to rescue us. We made hundreds of calls and ended up counting on ourselves. No food, no shelter. But anyhow, we're out. We are now looking for hotels. The water is not receding and the rainstorm continues. There are still hundreds of vehicles there. None of them are out, all trapped. They will die if no one comes to the rescue. NTD tried calling people trapped underground, but most of the numbers were unreachable. It's been almost 20 hours from around 1 p.m. yesterday till 8 this morning. They didn't have anything to eat. I just heard from them saying there's no rescue. A screenshot of a Chinese chat message circulating online captures the situation. A person trapped inside a subway car said, I'm still trapped in the subway. There was almost no oxygen just now. We're breaking the window. And the other person in the chat said the news is indeed fake. The news said you're all rescued. That's not the only problem Chinese media coverage appears to have glossed over this week. As the water rises in Beijing, the Chinese Communist Party's media mouthpieces aired reports about severe flooding in Europe and praised the beauty of Beijing's evening sky after the rainfall. Here's more. The Chinese Communist Party's media seems to be hard at work, but not with covering China's widespread flood disasters. Instead, it's beautifying the dangerous situation. State-backed media have been using this propaganda technique for generations. Take Beijing's recent rainstorm as an example. Heavy rains have been soaking Beijing for several days. Instead of reporting on the situation, China's official media outlet encouraged people to enjoy what it called the pink evening sun. Videos posted on social media show torrents running through the city's streets. Subway stations flooded, roads blocked and landslides causing damage. Multiple train services and 350 flights were canceled on Tuesday due to the inclement weather. 
One Beijing resident took a video inside a subway station on Sunday and likened the scene to a waterfall inside a cave. The rain is so heavy, you cannot even see the sky. Fog everywhere, the sky is so foggy that nothing is visible. Only the heavy rain pouring down like a river, like a waterfall. And this has been going on for at least one day and one night. That's as landslides caused by the rising water blocked local roads. But the Chinese Communist Party's newspaper, People's Daily, is focusing on another aspect. In a post on Monday, the outlet briefly mentioned the disaster, then called for people to enjoy, quote, the pink evening sun in the Beijing sky after the rain. We live in Beijing and cannot see it. They're talking nonsense, describing colorful clouds in the sky. We didn't see them. The only thing we see are dark clouds everywhere, darkness in the sky and on the ground, like hell, water everywhere in the city. And one day before that, the Chinese regime's top broadcaster, China Central Television, reported on flooding in Europe. A lot of Chinese people died from the disasters, but nobody cares whether they die or not. There are dead bodies floating in the river almost every day, and nobody reports on that. Most areas in China are still expecting heavy storms, and they're forecast to continue over the next few days. Coming up, the FBI is telling American pipeline operators to secure their systems against foreign threats. Hackers working for the Chinese Communist Party are known to have accessed at least 13 systems between 2011 and 2013. More on that after the break. Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. The FBI is saying today hackers working for the Chinese Communist Party access the IT systems of at least 13 American pipeline operators between 2011 and 2013. The agency says the hackers' ultimate goal was to physically damage the pipelines or disrupt their operation. NTD's Paul Graney spoke to experts earlier about the news. The FBI is telling American pipeline operators to secure their systems against foreign threats. It says hackers working for the Chinese Communist Party accessed at least 13 business systems between 2011 and 2013, aiming to damage pipelines or disrupt their operations. Where you can defeat a nation by attacking its critical infrastructures, shutting down the power grid, shutting down oil and gas pipelines. The hackers targeted specific employees with fake emails and other methods to get access to the pipelines. So now the FBI wants all general IT systems to be separated from the systems that control pipeline operations. Well, then that's going to take, you know, organizations a, a sizable amount of time and effort to, to get done. There's also the problem of pipelines using dial-up modems with little to no security or monitoring, a hacker's dream. And that's very similar to what we saw with that legacy VPN device that Colonial Pipeline uh, you know, kept talking about after they found out how they got hacked. Colonial Pipeline, America's largest oil line, was hacked and shut down in May. Fuel shortages and long gas lines followed. Colonial blamed a hacker group called Darkside for the attack, paying a ransom of $4.4 million. Provides half the fuel, not just for the eastern coast of the United States for civilian purposes, but for all of the military bases on the east coast. Prime wants protection for critical services to be included in the upcoming infrastructure package. Paul Graney, NTD News. A top U.S. lawmaker is urging President Biden to sanction Beijing. This in light of China's apparent state-backed hacking spree. On Monday, the U.S. and its allies accused the Chinese regime of hacking into Microsoft's exchange server. Hackers stole sensitive technologies and information from the U.S. and other countries. But despite this, Biden did not say that he will sanction China. Here's what he said after a reporter asked him about it. Effectively, your administration is naming and shaming China, but no sanctions. Why? And is that effective enough? They're still determining exactly what happened. 
The investigation is not finished. Thank you all very much. In a letter obtained by the Washington Examiner, House member Mike Rogers pointed out that the U.S. has previously sanctioned Russia for their cyber attacks. Rogers added, but this time around, when it comes to China, the U.S. only responded with a statement of condemnation. The U.S. Air Force is sending a record number of one of the world's most advanced fighter jets to a military drill in the Western Pacific. Many see this as a clear signal to China. Around 25 F-22 Raptor stealth fighter jets will be joining a U.S.-led exercise in Guam and Tinian this month. Commander of the U.S. Pacific Air Forces, General Ken Wilsbach, tells CNN that we have never had this many Raptors deployed together in the Pacific Air Force's area of operations. Hawaii-based defense analyst Carl Schuster says this sends an immediate message to China. Relations are tense between the two sides over issues like Taiwan and the South China Sea. F-22 deployments usually involve only 6 to 12 aircrafts. That's why he tells CNN the Pacific Air Force is demonstrating that it can deploy as many or more fifth-generation aircraft into the theater on short notice than China currently has in its entire inventory. It may not be a coincidence that the simulation takes place in Guam and Tinian. They are two U.S. overseas territories close to China, and Beijing has repeatedly threatened to attack Guam in the event of a military conflict. Last year, the Chinese military released a video demonstrating a simulated bombing of Guam by nuclear-capable aircrafts. According to the U.S. Pacific Air Forces, the purpose of operation is to uphold the country's 2018 national defense strategy. Objectives of the strategy include deterring foreign military aggression. It also places China as the principal threat to U.S. security. It's recognizing that China is undermining the world order. The Pentagon says China aims to achieve Indo-Pacific regional hegemony and eventually global dominance through its military. The U.S. State Department announced Wednesday that Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman will visit China next week. She'll be there after first visiting Japan, South Korea and Mongolia. This will be her second visit to Asia in less than two months. Sherman will meet with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and other officials in Tianjin City, which is close to Beijing. The U.S. State Department says the talks are part of ongoing U.S. efforts to hold candid exchanges to advance U.S. interests and values and to responsibly manage the relationship. Sherman says she will discuss areas where we have serious concerns about PRC actions, as well as areas where our interests align. Areas of concern the U.S. has with China include its numerous human rights abuses. And by areas where our interests align, the State Department is referring to climate issues. The announcement came after observers pointed out that China was not listed on Sherman's previous Asia trip itinerary. Senator Rand Paul says he's planning to ask the Justice Department for a criminal referral over Dr. Anthony Fauci's testimony about gain-of-function research at the Wuhan lab in China. And NTD's Allison Lee has that story. Republican Senator Rand Paul wants a criminal investigation into Dr. Anthony Fauci for what he considers lying to Congress, and he plans to ask the Department of Justice for it. He explained the decision to Fox News host Sean Hannity late Tuesday night. We have scientists that will line up by the dozens to say that the research he was funding was gain of function. There's still some conjecture as to whether or not it came from the lab, but he's lying about whether or not he funded gain of function research, and yes, he should be punished. Paul is referring to a Senate hearing earlier Tuesday when the two clashed over the National Institutes of Health, or NIH, funding gain of function research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. This research matches, these are Dr. Ebright's words, this research matches, indeed epitomizes, the definition of gain of function research done entirely in Wuhan. Do you wish to retract your statement of May 11th where you claimed that the NIH never funded gain of function research in Wuhan? Microphone. Your microphone. Senator Paul, I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. This paper that you are referring to was judged by qualified staff up and down the chain as not being gain of function. 
People convicted of lying to Congress can face up to five years in prison. The NIH defines gain-of-function experiments as scientific research that increases the ability of any of these infectious agents to cause disease by enhancing its pathogenicity or by increasing its transmissibility among mammals by respiratory droplets. The NIH had paused funding for certain gain-of-function research from 2014 to 2017. After the pause was lifted, the agency said that such research is important in helping them identify, understand, and develop strategies and effective countermeasures against rapidly evolving pathogens. Allison Lee, NTD News. Sweden's Volvo will become the first foreign automaker in China to own its business by 100 percent. So far, Beijing has required all non-Chinese automakers there to have a local joint venture partner. That's a condition for them in order to enter the Chinese market. Volvo is buying out its Chinese parent company, Geely Holdings, from their joint ventures in China. That could pave the way for an initial public offering for the Swedish automaker. Next year, China will no longer require foreign automakers to have a local joint venture partner. Analysts expect other foreign car makers to follow in Volvo's footsteps. Volvo's deal will give it full ownership of manufacturing plants in two Chinese cities. It will also obtain its Chinese sales company and its research and development facility in Shanghai. The deal is subject to regulatory approval and is expected to be completed by 2023. A Canadian official is working to make it illegal for Canadians to partake in China's forced organ harvesting industry. Member of Parliament Garnet Jenis aims to pass legislation that makes it a crime to receive organs that were forcibly harvested. He tells entities Don Ma that the bill will literally save lives. Next year, it might be illegal for Canadians to go to China for organ transplants. That's if the organs were forcibly harvested. Canadian Member of Parliament Garnet Jenis aims to pass legislation that makes it a criminal offense for Canadians to get organs abroad without the consent of the organ donor. Would you mind just talking a little bit about this bill? Well, thank you for this opportunity. Bill S-204 uh, deals with forced organ harvesting and trafficking. Uh, a, a big area of concern is obviously the industrial scale forced organ harvesting that we see, see taking place in the People's Republic of China. Uh, so this bill would make it a criminal offense for a Canadian to go abroad and receive an organ that was taken without the consent of the person whose organ it, uh, it was originally. In 2019, an international tribunal in the UK concluded that the scope of forced organ harvesting in China is in the millions. Those targeted include Falun Gong practitioners, Tibetans, Uyghurs, and House Christians. Mr. Janice says passing this bill could save lives because it aims to shut down demand for foreign organs in Canada. We, we know that the nature of the, the forced organ harvesting, especially that we see in China, is that uh, somebody is, is alive and then when there is a demand for, for their organs, they are killed and their organ is taken and, and transferred to the person who's seeking that organ. So uh, to the extent that we can shut down this demand for, for organs, we're, we're able to actually uh, stop people from being killed. So I think that's a, that's a really important, um, important outcome. I mean, we're, we're, we're saving lives, literally, by passing this legislation. Um, Janice presented the bill in the Canadian House of Commons last month, but it didn't pass before Parliament took recess for the summer. Filibustering from the opposition party may have been behind it. The Canadian MP will have to try again next year. Now, you mentioned filibustering, but could there also be influence from China that led to this outcome? I mean, I think there's there's two possible explanations. One is uh, the you know the fact that the government of China obviously does not want to see bills like this go forward, and the other is just uh, kind of raw partisanship. And we we do see instances where it seems that. Uh, the government of China is, is having an influence on, on the direction of this government. Uh, How much of China's influence are there in the Canadian government? Well, more, more broadly, this is certainly an issue that we're very concerned about. Um, you know, I think there's issues involving the Chinese Communist Party and, and also uh, foreign state-backed interference and intimidation in general. Um, at the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, we had scientists transferring deadly viruses back to uh, the Wuhan Institute for Virology. Uh, we had the cases of, of individuals who were openly members of the People's Liberation Army. So it's hard, it's hard for me to understand how 
this isn't setting off a lot of our alarm bells. I mean, wh what is the objective of uh, the Chinese military's research arm? It's to it's to gather information and data that will be useful uh, for the Chinese military. Uh, and that's that's a military that is, as we speak, uh, involved in genocide. Um, now, some have said the Chinese end goal is to achieve global hedge money. Is this something that China wants? Well, I think I think the Chinese Communist Party definitely uh, wants to control the direction of global events, and and they want to be the primary driver of those events. Absolutely, I think they've been they've been clear about that. I think in the in the title of a, a famous book, this this is what you might call a silent invasion. Uh, the efforts to to take our sovereignty from us, uh, but to do it in a in a subtle and surreptitious way. Uh, so clearly, a lot is at stake uh, for uh, for our. Jenis agrees that the more aware people are of what the Chinese Communist Party is doing, the harder it is for the regime to continue. And as for the organ harvesting bill, although it didn't pass this year, Jenis will push to get it passed next year. He says he'll do whatever it takes to make it law. Don Ma, NTD News. And that's all for today's China in Focus. But before you go, we have a special report coming up this Friday. In it, we look at whether Chinese stocks are safe for U.S. investors. Are Chinese stocks safe for U.S. investors? Just this month, one Chinese company sent many of them on a roller coaster ride. China's version of Uber, called Didi, came in the U.S. to sell its stock shares. It's expected to be the biggest stock market debut of the year. But in just 48 hours, Beijing dropped its hammer on the company. And Chinese ride-hailing app Didi shares fell 6% today after the Chinese regime said it launched an investigation into it. At one of its lowest points, DD shares plunged over 30 percent. But why is Beijing going after its biggest rideshare giant? What other companies are on the regime's radar? In this episode, we dive into Beijing's tug of war with its tech giants. Be sure to check it out on Epoch TV this Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern. China in Focus is partnering with the platform. That's where you can watch our exclusive content every Friday night. To subscribe, click epochtv.com slash China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.